All right. Um, well, thanks everyone. Thank you, Howard, and thanks to the organizers, not just for the invitation, but for uh, this seminar, which I think has provided a, a, a very nice uh, communal space for this community for the past year and a bit. So um, I'm going to talk today about um, the physics of a particular mechanism by which cancer cells uh, sense fluid flow. And um, what I'm showing you here actually is um, one of the main results for today. Actually, it's, it's the output of a model that I'll describe and it's showing the concentration of a particular molecule uh, outside of a cell, the cell is secreting this molecule in the presence of a background flow. And if I think if I were to ask you, I mean, just looking at it myself, um, what direction the flow is going, you'd be hard pressed to tell me. Um, and there's no free parameters to what I'm plotting here. So everything is, is coming from an experiment, which means that this is just to emphasize that the detection mechanism I'll describe to you today um, is providing, the cell is provided with very little information and it has to act on that information. Here's the contour map, it's a little bit easier. So uh, this is work that um, has been done by uh, four people in the group. So Sean, Nick, and Mike uh, started this work. Sean has since gone on to a postdoc with Eleni Cataphoria at Penn. Uh, Nick is, was an undergrad, he's at, uh, at Harvard, and uh, Mike just defended actually, and will be heading for a postdoc at Amolf. Um, and uh, Mike and Lewis have sort of continued the work, and, and I'll present a little bit of that, it's not published, and uh, Lewis is a relatively new member of the group. So, right, the, the story I'm going to tell you um, is a story about cancer cells, particularly uh, cells that uh, are participating in the process of metastasis. Metastasis itself is a many step process where uh, cells basically break off from the main tumor, they find a vessel, they circulate around the body, they get out of the vessel and they start, start a secondary tumor. And that's why it's such a deadly stage of cancer. I'm actually just gonna focus on the intravasation stage where cells are essentially tasked with, once they leave the tumor, finding the location of the vessel. And there's many cues that guide cells as they do that. Um, chemical cues, most notably that the oxygen levels in, in tumors are very low, so that provides a cue toward um, greener pastures, so to speak. Um, whether you like it or not, the cells in your body are often co-opted to help guide cancer cells in this quest. Um, the matrix is often reorganized to help. And then there are other mechanical signals such as, as I'm gonna talk about today, the presence of slow background, so-called interstitial fluid flows that um, in particular for uh, the lymphatic system are often draining into the lymphatic vessels and um, cancer cells will sort of hijack that information as a guiding cue. So the importance of interstitial flow in uh, guiding um, uh, metastatic cancer cells was uh, sort of vi vividly il illustrated in a landmark paper in 2007 by the group of Melody Schwartz, where they used an in vitro system to uh, provide cells with flows that were of the same order of magnitude as interstitial flows in the body. And of course, when there was no flow, then they, they didn't observe very much cell migration, but when they turned on the flow, then they saw that the cells migrated in the direction of the flow. And then importantly, when they blocked a receptor they thought was involved in this process that indeed the, um, the, flow, the migration stopped or, or was less, and this is a receptor called CCR7 that is actually um, cognate to a ligand that the cell itself secretes. And so that led to a proposal whereby the cell is essentially creating its own guidance cue. It's secreting molecules into the environment. Those, that creates sort of a diffusive cloud. Uh, the cloud gets biased by the flow and it's detecting those very same molecules. And because of the bias, it's detecting more molecules at the front of the cell than the back of the cell where the front is defined by the flow direction here. So they termed this 
autologous chemotaxis because it's a chemotaxis to a signal provided uh, by the cell itself. And sure enough, you know, if you if you tag the uh, the ligand, which is CCL21, then you see that it is indeed um, binding to the cell surface itself. And then that's essentially gearing up the actin polymerization and the other migration machinery, um, more so on the on the in the flow direction side than than other sides of the cell. So this is sort of a fascinating mechanism. It was shown to um, occur not just in uh, breast cancer cells, but also in other types of cancer. And so it seems to be uh, fairly widespread. And it's also not that unfamiliar. I mean, it seems kind of uh, fantastical or, or, or impressive, but you know, we're familiar at least metaphorically with this kind of guidance uh, technique, right? So here's a cartoon of a golfer um, trying to figure out which way the wind flow is going. And so they secrete some grass and uh, the cloud of grass is biased by the flow of the wind. And of course they need to detect this grass and for that they use their eyes. And uh, then they do some computations in their brain and that leads to a migratory action. They migrate their golf club, you know, <laughs> properly. So it's, it's uh, the cell of course has different tools but it's, it's the same basic idea, right? And, and for this, I'm gonna focus really on the secretion flow and detection process from, from here on, right? Not necessarily the downstream actions. So um, when, the students I, I showed you and me started sort of digging into this um, fascinating study, we noticed a few curious facts. Um, one is that the flow is extremely slow and that can be quantified by uh, a dimensionless number called the Peclé number, which is the ratio of sort of ballistic uh, effects due to the flow and diffusive effects. And uh, that's less than one. It never really gets much above one tenth. And so from that perspective, things are dominated, you know, the molecular motion is dominated by diffusion. So that's, that seems challenging uh, for this mechanism. The secretion rate is also slow. If you, if you sort of crunch the numbers, you see that basically each cell is only secreting a couple thousand molecules per hour. And the whole process is observed over 15 hours. And that, so they, they sort of start migrating within a few hours. So this is really only being handled by a few thousand molecules with uh, you know, a diffusion dominated space. So it really raised for us um, a basic question and that is, is this mechanism even plausible? I mean, we weren't, you know, I, I don't wanna be skeptical by nature or anything, but like we were just wondering, is this, does this even make sense, right? So how do you answer this question? And that I think kind of nicely uh, reminds us of the title of this seminar, which, which I think is great, right? Because on the one hand, it's, it's sort of right there in the title that we're uniting um, two schools of thought, right? Physicists who like to think about biology, biology who, biologists who, who wanna be more mechanistic and quantitative. But you know, there's this, literally a division sign in, in the title of this seminar. So that, that sort of reflects perhaps a, a, a two opposing approaches to how you might answer a basic question like this. Right, so, so if you are interested in the biology, you might say, okay, well, how does this work? Well, we need to understand, you know, what the shape of the cell is that's doing the secretion, maybe what the shape of the ligand and the, and, and the receptor are. And, you know, for that matter, the ligand is sort of flowing through a very complex space dominated by, you know, different fibers and different components of the extracellular matrix. And there's, of course, plenty of data on all of these, thing, these things, but integrating that into a final answer to, to this question, to my mind is, you know, incredibly daunting. On the other hand, you could sort of take the biological physics approach and, and you know, cavalierly ignore all of those details and um, try to minimalize things as much as possible and just say, you know, okay, this might be kind of wrong in the end, but, you know, I, I just want to know whether with very basic shapes and assumptions, this is even possible at all. Um, so, you can tell by probably the vibes uh, I'm giving and not least of which my affiliation too, uh, that I'm, I took the, you know, our group took the, the left-hand approach here. And we are not the first ones, um, of course, uh, asking questions about biological sensing using ideas or approaches from physics has a long history, um, arguably begun by Berg and Purcell in a paper they published in the Biophysical Journal, to their credit, the journal Physical Biology didn't exist yet. 
And they were interested in bacteria, right? As, as Howard uh, mentioned, bacteria swim in, in fluids and they were interested in this process. Howard Berg, of course, is famous for studying this process. And so their approach was to treat the cell as a permeable sphere, essentially, and, and ask, okay, you know, how many molecules of the nutrient that it's trying to track are, you know, would fill the cell volume? And, you know, that's easy. You just multiply the volume by the background concentration. And of course, that number has its own noise because diffusive, diffusion is a, a Poisson process. And so the variance equals the mean. And they also recognize that if the cell is willing to wait, then diffusion will sort of refresh the molecules. And, it, you know, you can get multiple independent measurements, which can produce this noise. And so, you, you know, you calculate the typical diffusion time and that's how many measurements you can make in, in the amount of time T that the cell is willing to wait. And at the end of the day, you get, you know, basically a, a relative noise measure, which is now, as many of you know, as the Berg per cell limit. And it simply says that the cell can sense better if, um, you know, it's bigger, if the molecules diffuse more, if the concentration is higher, or if the cell is willing to wait more time, right? So this is the flavor of the approach that I'm espousing here. And the important thing in their case and in our case is that it's simple, but it can make some predictions. And in particular, they predicted how long a bacterium would need to run during its run and tumble motion in order to have sufficient statistics so that the basically the difference in molecule number from the beginning to the end it was bigger than the, the standard deviation in that difference. And you know you can manipulate their limit and you get this expression, which is entirely in terms of measurable things. And you find they need to run for at least half a second. And that's indeed true. Bacterial run times in, in these conditions are you know, on the order of a second. So bacteria obey the limit. They obey it quite closely. Uh, something simple says something quantitative about biological behavior. So all right, so how would we apply that kind of thinking to this flow sensing problem? So here, the molecules are supplied by the cell, and they're drifting because of the flow, as well as diffusing. So we're, we're again going to treat the cell as a permeable sphere, but we're interested in the cell's ability to tell a direction. So we want to sort of imagine the cell counting the number of molecules in, in one half and the other half. And if it's more in one than the other, if this number N2 is bigger than N1, then that's giving the cell the signal for the direction, right? So. All right, so how can we sort of think about N1 and N2 in terms of the parameters of the system? So I've basically written things in terms of rates here, right? The cell secretes molecules at a rate nu. Uh, the molecules are drifting to the right, and we can make a rate out of the drift velocity by dividing it by the size of the cell A. And they're also diffusing away. Again, we can make a rate by dividing A squared. And so now if you take sort of all the rates in divided by all the rates out of each half and subtract them, then that's basically a back of the envelope estimate for this difference N2 minus N1. And you find that indeed it depends, uh, you can write it in terms of the Peclet number, for example, and the faster the flow, uh, you know, the more this difference is. Now, in terms of sensing, we also want to do, as Berg and Purcell, calculate the, the noise. And we're assuming here that the noise, like they did, is just due to diffusive arrivals and it's Poissonian. And so we take the, the mean and divide by the number of refresh times. And again, you can wrap this up as a, a relative error. And you find that the error goes down if the Peclet number is bigger, if the cell secretes more molecules, or if it waits longer. Okay, Also very reasonable. Now, the problem is that for you know, a diffusive sensing task, that seems reason that seems okay, I guess. I mean, it might not, um, but it, it, it worked out okay for Berg and Purcell. Here, however, it's sort of irresponsible to assume that the cell is permeable to the flow because we know this is at low Reynolds number. The flow is, is doing these nice sort of laminar flow lines and sort of most importantly, as it, as it sort of has to avoid the sphere, it's, the velocity is going to zero at the sphere, and that's where the molecules are being secreted and detected. So it's, you know, it's an it's sort of a an important question to ask: Is this even right? Like, did we underestimate the noise, or is is the scaling just completely wrong because of this? So, um, as you might imagine, we we buckled down, and I'm sparing you all the details here, but we solved the problem a bit more rigorously, right? We wrote down the Navier-Stokes equation for the flow. 
in the high viscosity, low permeability limit. High viscosity means low Reynolds number, no inertial terms, low permeability uh, is what's otherwise known as the Brinkman equation. The Brinkman equation has been solved for uh, a single sphere. And so we exploited that fact. And then you, you use that velocity field in the diffusion with drift equation to understand the, the uh, concentration profile for the, the secreted molecules. And then on top of that, we need to account for um, the fluctuations because molecules are particulate and um, the, the sort of Poisson-like fluctuations are sort of on top of this concentration field and that's what's determining the sensory error. And after all that, we essentially define a, an anisotropy measure, which is the uh, angular average, or the, the average over the surface of the cosine that's sort of biasing front to back. And what do we get? We get indeed the same scaling plus some other terms, but those other terms vanish if the uh, receptor binding is diffusion limited. So if the affinity is strong enough. Um, but we do indeed get a larger prefactor evidently from this laminar flow. The one becomes a seven. <laughs> so, okay, the scaling was right. The seven actually turns out to be kind of important because we have now actually a prediction that has very few parameters, all of which are, are estimated from experiments. And, and this sort of, this is the concentration field I was plotting at the beginning. And the prediction is that this error, the ability of a cell to sort of, you know, detect the direction, you can think of this as like a percent error, uh, goes down with, with time. And uh, basically anything below this line is theoretically impossible according to this, you know, physical mechanism that I've described. And so you'll notice that, you know, by the time you get to 15 hours, which was the duration of the entire experiment, this, this line doesn't get much below 30%, right? And as I said, the cells have begun moving at the beginning of the experiment. So really they're acting on, you know, at, at most, well, I should say at, at least 90, 70, something, you know, something like 50% error. And so whatever mechanism they actually have in, involving receptors and downstream processing, a lot of which should really only add some noise, um, they're, they're still you know, operating very, very close to this physical bound is what, is what this tells us at least. So that's why I say these cancer cells are operating very close to the, the physical limit. So that is actually not the end of the story. Um, it turns out that four years after the paper of Melody Schwartz, there was a, a study that came out of the group of Roger Cam where uh, they used a microfluidic device actually. And that, that allowed them to look at this autologous chemotaxis process at varying cell densities. They could see the, the device with different densities. And what they saw is indeed, if they seeded the device with a low cell density, then uh, cells migrated with the flow. And they, they also showed it was due to autologous chemotaxis. They could block the receptors and, and that didn't happen. But um, if the cell density was sufficiently high, then something strange happened. The cells actually turned around and migrated against the flow. And so to figure out what was going on, they uh, dug in a little deeper and, and used some fluorescence microscopy and observed that when the flow was turned on, especially at these high densities, then the uh, phosphorylation activity of uh, focal, the focal adhesion kinase was high, especially at the membranes of these cells, which is associated with you know, the cells sort of forming these adhesions and crawling you know, through the extracellular matrix up, up the flow. And so that led them to hypothesize that there were two competing mechanisms actually vying for the cell's attention. Um, the autologous chemotaxis uh, guiding cells down the flow and a pressure sensing mechanism, sort of a, a mechano sensing mechanism that was detecting a pressure gradient that was driving cells back up the flow. And indeed, if you block the uh, focal adhesion kinase activity, then you see that the cells go back down the flow again with the flow. Although, because it's at this high density with not nearly as much you know, directional accuracy. And so the, the overall picture that came out of this study is that, as I said, there's two competing mechanisms. The autologous chemotaxis will um, migrate with the flow and the pressure sensing against the flow. But the 
The chemical sensing part, the chemotaxis, is cell density dependent, right? And so that means that at, at low cell densities, uh, chemical sensing wins. At high cell densities, pressure sensing wins. And that's responsible for the change in direction. And the mechanical sensing part is, is extremely interesting, um, and we're, we're thinking about it now. But for the rest of the talk, I just want to sort of dig a little deeper into why chemical sensing, this autologous chemotaxis, might depend on cell density. And I think it, it's rather intuitive, right? If you're just a single cell and you're secreting your own molecules in the presence of flow, then that's a, that's a sufficient mechanism. But if you're in the presence of lots of other cells at high density, then their own molecule clouds are kind of corrupting the information that you're receiving from yours. And so we wanted to try to sort of understand quantitatively whether that was sufficient to see this sort of failure of the autologous chemotaxis mechanism. So as a first pass, we basically treat, you know, we, we identify a cell of interest and we treat all the other cells as sort of a smeared mean field uniform cloud supplied by their molecules that's just sort of like a background concentration corrupting the the um, activity of the of the cell of interest right so we can return to this kind of like thought experiment here and ask okay well how does this change when you're doing flow sensing but now with a background concentration and the answer is that the difference in molecule numbers on the two halves of the cell well that doesn't change right because the background just lifts both up but the mean molecule number in the cell itself, or in either half, you could say, uh, does change, right? That's lifted up by, you know, the background concentration times the volume of the cell. And you can, if you think about the anisotropy measure as basically the ratio of the difference to the mean, then you can see that it, uh, you, you put these together and it falls off with the background concentration. And of course, uh, we went back to our, our theory and, and incorporated this more rigorously and you get an expression of the same form. You just are missing some factors of water unity. You get an eight here and a four pi there, et cetera. So that's the first part. The second part is, okay, how is this background concentration related to the cell density, the density of the cells that are supplying it? And for that, we basically have started with a, a, a very simple flux argument, right? So if in steady state, you take the number of molecules secreted by the cells into the chamber, and that has to be equal to the, to the number of molecules that are leaving the chamber due to the flow, right? So secreted molecules are the number of cells here written as the cell density rho times the volume of this box times the number of molecules secreted by each cell in some time window delta T. And the number of molecules flowing out is the background concentration we're trying to solve for times the sliver of volume that's essentially leaving the chamber due to the flow in this time delta t. So you can solve for the background concentration. You see that it indeed scales with the cell density in the, in the chamber. And then you can plug it into this, the, the rigorous expression we had before. And you can indeed see that anisotropy falls off as the cell density gets higher. And the plot in, on a log-log scale, just to sort of see this transition, is, is shown here. And now, you know, it's sort of time to ask, we, we now have sort of a quantitative picture informed only by experimental parameters that uh, tells you how the chemical sensing is supposed to fail. And now we can ask, well, does this comport with the low and high cell densities that, uh, that were observed in, in the experiment from Roger Camp's group? So in other words, like if they, if both low and high cell densities were up here, that wouldn't make sense because they can both sense, you know, they both have a very high anisotropy. If both were down here, that would also wouldn't make sense because, you know, they should both fail. Um, but indeed, they really fall right at this transition point. These are the cells in red that go with the flow. These are, these are the cells in green that go against the flow. And, and this sort of gives, is quantitatively consistent with the fact that Chemosensing is failing and pressure sensing is taking over here. And by the way, you know, this is a log log plot, right? So at the low cell density, you're really just only half as good as a single cell, but at the high cell density, you're, you've reduced your, your sensing ability by a factor of six. Okay, so that is essentially what I want to tell you today. I, you know, I hope in general, I've convinced you that simple calculations from physics can place limits on what biology can do in particular for sensing.
cancer cells seem to approach the limits for this autologous chemotaxis mechanism. And then the failure of autologous chemotaxis is quantitatively consistent with this pressure sensing mechanism setting on. And, you know, I've become kind of obsessed with these sorts of uh, physical limit calculations. And we've, we've done a lot of this type of work in the group, if you're interested. Um, I think the, the sort of thing that we're thinking about next, as I, as I mentioned, is what are the limits to this mechano sensing? I mean, cells have, you know, tension sensitive channels, they have uh, cilia that deflect. I mean, it's, it's kind of an open frontier. So we're, we're looking into that now. Um, and with that, I will acknowledge um, the group and, and the support and I guess take a question or two. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for a wonderful talk. So we have some time for questions. So the first question I want to ask is from Robin Bruinsma. And it is, uh, is it okay to assume Navier-Stokes for flow in tissue? Uh, the Navier-Stokes limit we're interested in is of course the the very low Reynolds number flow um, in the in tissue part may suggest that you're concerned about gunk in the background and that's essentially no okay oh, Do you want just to clarify? that if you are in a very dense medium then you have to look at the perturbation of the flow by the other cells in the neighborhood yeah so that's essentially coarse grained in the Brinkman equation and is accounted for by the the low variability the low permeability limit Okay, um, can I ask uh, one point about that? You can create from the diffusion coefficient and the velocity a length scale, the diffusion coefficient over the velocity. I was guessing that that length scale should play a role either being bigger or smaller than the radius of a particle. Um, that happens, well, for example, in flow of heat or of particles. Okay, uh, I think I, I think we've done that. I've I couched it in time scales, but indeed diffusion to velocity is a length scale and the ratio of that to the radius Ah, so is indeed the Peclet number, the inverse Peclet number in your case. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. the Peclet number is small. It's the Peclet small. number is small. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And that's actually the perturbation parameter I neglected to mention. That's how we can get away with any of this theory. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Ricard Alert, and he's asking why are integration times longer than 15 hours experimentally prohibited? Oh, because they, they, they only did the experiment for 15 hours. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the next question uh, is from Emiliano Perez Pina. And their question is, these Borg Purcell limits are always valid for long asymptotic times. How does it work in your case? Can you really use this limit to predict errors at times of the order of one hour? Yeah, so there's sort of two answers to that question, um, the cell acts on a time on the order of an hour, right? And so if we, uh, yeah, if we assume some sort of time scale separation between detection computation and then action, then I think it's fair to assume that the cell makes many measurements as or before it acts. Um, but I, I think maybe a, a more abstract answer might be that, um, a lot of people give guff about uh, the assumption of these type of this type of calculation, which is basically that the cell kind of integrates, 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 and then acts, and it integrates uniformly in time and so forth. So um, there's some nice work from decision theory that's been applied uh, to these types of sensing problems, where it's acting and and integrating at the same time, and it's waiting until a threshold is is met, and and that can actually provide bounds that are a little bit sharper. Right, I will ask a related question uh, from Sujit Dutta. And Sujit is asking, could your results on flow sensing be applicable to bacteria that are stuck somewhere? For example, in tight pores inspired by Howard's talk and can you know th therefore access longer integration times than motile bacteria? That is a great question. Um, the technical answer is uh, our results would be applicable if, okay, if it's low Reynolds number, check. If it's low permeability, check. If it's a porous medium, I think that's totally fair. And then, as I said, everything is sort of assuming a, a small Peclet number, but going from eukaryotes to bacteria only shrinks A. So I, I think absolutely. 